We're going to start in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse, I think we left off around verse 42, in case you're, you've forgotten, <laughs> we're in Acts, lots happened between last class and this one, I'm glad we're all safe and sound, as far as I know everybody, um, everybody is safe and sound after Hurricane Irma. Although I uh, I haven't uh, talked to Devana or um, or Kathleen uh, Thomas, um, here comes Keith and Sandra, uh, so that's good. Um, so anyway, if uh, you know maybe we can uh, try to contact those that aren't here tonight uh, that we haven't already heard from and, and make sure that everybody's okay after the storm. It's good to see everyone. Everyone here tonight that's here, and um, oh, there's Cindy. Okay, all right. So we're we left off in Acts chapter two, beginning about verse forty-two, I think. And uh, before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Our dear heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, keeping us safe till this time, for uh, helping us to weather the storm, and uh, for all of the blessings and the care that you have shown to us through our lives, and we pray that you'll continue to be with us, help us to glorify you, and with our lives, and with our blessings, um, and help us in our study this evening to know how best to glorify you, and know how to be truly the people um, that belong to you, and the people that you would have us to be. Help us to love you more and love Jesus more, love the Holy Spirit more, and appreciate all that you have done for us. And in the, when this life is over, bring us safely to heaven. And, dear God, we pray that you'll be with those that are not here, that um, perhaps need uh, your care, um, and help us to understand what, what we can do to help them, that they might be back with us, whether it be a spiritual need or physical need. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. Acts chapter 2. So we left off um, with Peter in in Acts chapter 2, preaching this sermon that's often called the first gospel sermon. Um, It is one of the first gospel sermons, certainly. And it was um, apparently very effective because we now we, are, we now have three thousand souls, about three thousand souls, in verse forty-one, um, that received the word and were baptized. And of course, Peter's message, his answer to brothers, "What shall we do?" was repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, so about 3,000 people did that. They were added, it says, in verse 41. They were added that day about 3,000 souls. So, uh, Luke next tells us what these 3,000 plus souls did once they were added. And so we're going to begin there. Um, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, reading through the end of the chapter. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God 
and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. All right, so let's remember who these people are. Uh, besides the 120 that Jesus left there, um, that we talked about in Acts chapter 1, which included the uh, 12 apostles, the 12 witnesses, we now have these 3,000 souls. These 3,000 souls were um, of what um, religion, formally? They were Jews, right? So they were Jews. Some were Jews by birth. Some were Jews because they were proselytes, it says. Um, But they were all of the Jewish faith. And they were there to observe one of the feasts um, during which all Jews would come together at Jerusalem. And so they were there and then they heard this message about Jesus and they decided to obey that message. So, what did they do? Well, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So you see, it wasn't just that these Jews found out about Jesus and that they decided that what they had done to Jesus was wrong and they repented and they were baptized and then they went on their merry way. They devoted themselves to this. There was more to it than just this conversion or this baptism. There was a devotion that needed to be a part of it. And so they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. How much did they know about the gospel up until this time? All we know that they do. All we know. Okay. All right. Right. All the apostles were. They were all taught the same thing. They all knew that. Now, it does say with many other words, there was more teaching than this. This mm-hmm. is what we know they did. Right. So what kind of teaching do you think the apostles were uh, providing? What, were they, what teaching were they devoting themselves to? <laughs> what the Holy Spirit told them to tell? Well, right? Okay, so yeah, I, I, I think um, I think one one thing that we could probably point out is that these were people who had rejected Jesus, right? And so, as people that have newly accepted Jesus, they would need to know what it was that Jesus wanted them to do, right? They would need want they would need to know basically all the things that Jesus taught in his ministry. Um, that these 120 and the apostles were privy to because they did not reject Jesus. They followed Jesus. And so um, so basically they've got some catching up to do, uh, I think is one thing. And then, yes, how, how to be a church, how to be, how to be uh, a group, a gathering of God's people. Uh, Keith, you had your hand up? Right. 
Okay. Couple things that. Uh, there were probably. Isn't that exactly? Yeah, that's exactly what Peter finished preaching to them and left them in that state of, of despair. If I'm undone, you know, what am I going to do? And yeah, and so yeah, exactly. That, and, and yeah, and again, that's what that was Peter's message. Repent. That's the change. Repent and be baptized. Now, and we see the change because here, instead of being concerned about celebrating uh, the feast of uh, of the harvest, the Pentecost, now they're devoted to what the apostles are saying. They're devoted to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship amongst these brethren. With the fellowship with the apostles and with their fellow um, Christians, to the breaking of bread. Okay, so what what's the breaking of bread referred to here? Okay, now we have that mentioned um, in verse forty six. Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Now. Is is there a difference here because it says they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread? No, that's one of those arguments, frankly. One case, the Lord's Supper, the other case, common meal. I don't think we can tell. I don't think we have any way of telling that. That is not defined. One is being different from the other. I think there is an indication. Okay. Yeah. Well, all I can present is my own thoughts, and that is the fact that it says they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread makes it seem like more than just a meal. Because you wouldn't devote yourself to just having a meal. You would devote yourself to worship. And these, these all seem like worshipful things that they're doing. They're the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the the coming together, uh, breaking of bread and the prayers. That, so, in my mind, it seems that this would be referring to the Lord's Supper. But, you know, it, it is a little ambiguous. Yes, Keith. Uh-huh. Amen. Right? Amen. Right, and that's why I think that's a different breaking of the bread there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But... Uh, but it doesn't say that they did this on Sunday. 
either. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's ambiguous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So move, move, <laughs> moving on from that. All of this that's happening, what effect did that have on the people that saw them, that dealt, that came into contact with them, that knew about them? Okay, it says in verse 47, they had favor with all the people. What about this in verse 43? And awe came upon every soul. Is that referring to just these Christians or is it referring to everyone? Every soul. That would make it seem for a global statement than just. Yeah. Okay. Other thoughts? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it, uh, this this word awe in the ESV can also be rendered reverent uh, fear. Um, so, so yeah, there's there's an element of, of uh, fear there, and and part of that I think is what this says about that there are many wonders and signs being done through the apostles. And so and now I'm going to tell you, I walked in this door thinking that this was talking about the Christians, but. I read it again just before I started talking, and I thought, wait a minute. That may be talking about everyone saw what was happening, and I'm like, wow, what's going on over there? Yes, smart. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right, okay. And, right, and 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 I'm I'm going to say right now I'm getting a little more bogged down in this than I intended to, because what I want us to do is look at this passage. I do want to spend some time on it because I think this informs us to a great deal about what the church is supposed to look like, um, because this is. The first church. This is the first congregation of of Christians, of God's people, in in the latter times, right? Um, and how many of them were there? Well, how many how many how many congregations were there? Oh, one. There was the, yeah. Well, it was just the one, right? Yeah, just the one. Okay. And so <clears throat> this is where it begins, right? Um, and so we need to pay attention. To what they did. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Okay? Very important. To the fellowship. They didn't just, you know, get baptized, like I said, and go off on their own and say, hey, I'm a Christian now. Aren't I great? No, they stayed there. They had fellowship with the rest of them. Uh, breaking of bread and prayers. They were together. There was awe there. They saw the wonders and signs. They were informed by that. Um, All right, and so then continuing, all who believed were together and had all things in common. What does that tell us? They shared, right? Because it says, they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. There was no one... I think we're going to read uh, later in the end of chapter 4. There was nobody that was needy in this group. Everybody had whatever it was that they needed. They shared what they had. Um, And day by day, uh, day by day, that, that should inform us, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. So, okay, so what's the attitude as they're sharing these things. Gladness, okay? It's not... 
Right. So we have this attitude of gladness, joyfulness, generosity, sharing, fellowship, devotion. This is what the church, the first church, was like. Praising God and then maybe the most important thing, well, besides praising God, having favor with all the people. So people looked at this congregation of Jesus believers and what did they see? Uh huh. Okay. 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 They they saw people that shared the yes. Okay, and that's why praising God and having favor with all the people is so important because they saw them praising God. They saw how they treated one another. They saw how they loved each other and how devoted they were to what the apostles were teaching. They saw the signs and wonders that the apostles were doing and realized that God is there. God is with them. And what was the result at the end of verse 47? Exactly. The Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Good question. How do you get in the church? Right. Okay, right. The Lord adds you. The Lord adds Lord adds adds you to the number. And that goes back to in verse 41. So those who received the word were baptized and there were added that day about 3000 souls. Who added those 3000 souls? The Lord did. The apostles didn't say, "Okay, you've been baptized, you're welcome in." You know. I mean, maybe they did say that. But that's not what added them to the church. It was God that added them to the church because they received the word and obeyed it. Right? Right. Okay, so. Makes sense? Everybody got the picture of, of, of who we're talking about? This group? Everybody got the picture that we need to put in our minds when we think about ourselves and 14th Avenue? This is the, this is the picture that should guide us, that we should be trying to look like um, because everyone should be able to look at us and we should have favor with all the people. Or at least we should not be giving them any reason to not favor us. Some people will reject us just because of what we stand for. Um, we know that. We know that. But, um, all right. So, moving on to chapter 3. If there's no further comments or questions. <clears throat> now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk, and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. All right, we'll stop there for now. Let's make sure we get the picture of what's happening here.
Um, we have a man, and how lame was this man? All right, since birth, that's very important. He couldn't walk at all. He had to be carried in. He was laid at the beautiful gate. Uh, that's the name of the gate, the beautiful gate. And uh, I did just did a quick search, and I couldn't. You know, there's speculation on which gate was really the beautiful gate. Not not a lot of information there, but. The fact that Luke names the gate, what does that, what does that tell you? Very, right. Okay. All right. And yeah, and it's a specific location. Do you think it's a location that would be known to people? Absolutely. Right. Okay. So I get the impression that this is a gate that a lot of people are coming in and out of the temple. Right. And I mean, it's the beautiful gate. Why wouldn't you go in that gate? You know, who would who wants to go in the the trashy gate? I mean, you know, <laughs> you you go in the beautiful gate. All right. So, so I, I get the impression that a lot of people are coming in and out of this gate to the temple, and there's this lame man carried there. How often is he there? Daily. So, how many people see this lame man? Lame man every day. All right. Everyone. Okay. So, uh, so this, you know. This is not, how likely is it that this man was a plant for Peter and John just, just to, uh, to pull a trick? Yeah, to pull a trick on them. Okay, so there's, there's, you know, very, very zero chance that this is a... a right, yeah, they've been working on this for decades, you know, <laughs> waiting for this. Yes. Right. To refute, very easy to refute. CNN. <laughs> All right. So, so the so the point is that um, the we understand then why the reaction to this miracle happening. There was no doubt that a miracle happened here. There, was there any doubt at who did the miracle, who performed the miracle? No. Why? Because the lame man is leaping and walking with them into the temple. All right, so he's there with Peter and John. So yeah, maybe nobody heard Peter say what he said to the lame man, but there was no doubt that this guy who couldn't walk is now walking into the temple with Peter and John. And not just walking, but leaping and praising God. Which which is another thing. How totally was this man healed? 100%, maybe even better than 100%. All right? Yeah. Right. Exactly. Everybody knew. And so they're all wonder, uh, filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. And so here's a man. He's praising God. He's praising God, walking and leaping. And then they go into the house of God. As he's praising God, all right. So every, there's there's no question in anybody's mind that God is in this that has happened. All right. So let's keep reading. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, "Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this, or why do you stare at us as though by our own power?" Or Piety, we have made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, 
has made this man strong, whom ye see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers, but what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that He may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for the restoring of all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of His holy prophets long ago. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days, You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your father, saying to Abraham, And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. All right, so Peter gets another opportunity. And I think there's a lesson in here for us. Acts 2 was an opportunity for Peter to stand. Peter saw an opportunity to stand up and speak. And he did. All the people rushed together because the Holy Spirit brought them there with that sound of the wind and the the flames um, and, and the speaking in tongues. And then Peter took that opportunity and stood up and spoke. Here again, the Holy Spirit provides an opportunity for Peter to speak because everyone sees the miracle and they rush together. And Peter saw it and he spoke. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. And yes, uh, Peter, yeah. Exactly. Uh, strengthening his brethren, just as Jesus said. And, um, and so, so Peter begins to address the crowd. And the first thing he says is, why do you, why do you wonder at this? <coughs> um, what is he reminding them of about this miracle? Uh, by who? By Jesus, yes. Could someone uh, ring the first bell for me, please? Um, So, yes, by Jesus and by Jesus. Yeah, exactly, by Jesus. That's exactly his point. And that's the point he continues to make. Yeah, exactly. So, so he's saying, don't look at me. This isn't about me. And this, this is something that we need to remember when we teach others. It's not about you teaching others the gospel. It's not about the power that you have and your great persuasive abilities. It's not about that. It's about God's power. Um, the same with the church. You know, we're, It's not about the church. The gospel is not about the church. The gospel is about Jesus. It's about the gospel is the power of God to save. And we ought to present it as such and not just try to bring people in the door, not try to convert people to our church, but convert people to Christ instead. Um, and so uh, that, that's something to remember. It's not about us. The, um, he, he talks about the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers. And these are all Jews. They would have understood who he was talking about, they would have understood that this was God working this miracle, but he turns it from God to Jesus, saying the one that you crucified, the one that you rejected, when Pilate was going to release him, you rejected him, you denied him, God raised him from the dead, and it's in his name that this was done. So, this is not very different from that first sermon that we hear from Peter. You rejected him. God raised him from, from the dead. It's his power that you're seeing. And so, if Jesus, the, the implication is, if Jesus has this power, you ought to listen to him too. 
Um, he calls Jesus the author of life. What does he mean by that? Okay, right. Exactly, the author of life. If you want life, Jesus is the source of that. Jesus is the author of that. So his point is that if you want to be saved, you go to who? Jesus, right? The power is not in the temple. The power is not in your Jewish heritage. The power is in, not in Peter or John. The power is in Jesus. He has the power to heal this man. He has the power to save. And so he gives them the opportunity for redemption in verse 17. I know you did it in ignorance, you and your rulers, but and, and this is what God planned. God foretold that this would happen, and now it's time for you to repent. Right, right. Yeah, we don't see that element in the first sermon. Um, right, right. Um, yeah, and I, I almost wonder, you know, because some of these same people are people that might have heard the first sermon. Uh, I almost wonder if he's appealing to a different side or a different group of people who are thinking in, in different ways. Well, you know... We had no idea. We had no 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 clue. We weren't really involved in that, you know. And he's saying, "Oh, well, yeah, you were ignorant about this, but it's time to repent. Now you know, just like you said. Thank you. Um, okay, repent therefore and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out." Um, let's see. Running out of time here. Um, and then he points out, okay, well, I'll just mention this. If you look at Exodus chapter 32, verses 30 through 34, the idea of blotting out is there. But in that case, he's talking about those that sinned against God being blotted out. Moses says, if you, uh, if you will not forgive these people, this is after the golden calf, uh, I think. I may have that wrong. Uh, but if you will not forgive these people, then blot me out of your book. And God says, no, I will blot out who, whoever sins against me. Well, this kind of turns that on its head. Now they have a chance to have their sins blotted out instead. So basically, Peter's message is, the state you're in right now, you've rejected God's anointed. You've rejected the author of life. You're going to be blotted out. But if you repent and turn back, you can have your sins blotted out instead. And so, yeah, big difference, exactly. Um, and then finally, he points out that uh, God having... He points out the covenant, that they were sons of the covenant, that um, in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And of course, we know that Jesus is the fulfillment of that. Through Jesus... The offspring of Abraham, all the families of the earth would be blessed. But he says, God sent Jesus to them first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Wouldn't it be a shame if this blessing was sent to all the earth through the Jews and the Jews missed it? The Jews did not, have, uh, did not turn from their wickedness. And I believe that's, that's Peter's point in bringing this up. All right. Well, uh, so we got through chapter 3. Any comments or questions about that? I know we kind of went through that last part quickly. Um, Sunday, Caleb Atkinson's going to be here. Uh, he'll be teaching class. I'm not sure what he's going to teach, but uh, uh, he's going to take over. So we will pick up with chapter 4 on Thursday, and maybe I can try to move a little bit faster, otherwise we're never going to finish the book doing one chapter at a time. All right, thank you for your comments and your attention.